Welcome to the first virtual episode of The Forum. My name is Dr. Kyrie Williams, and I'm the director of the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Center here at Austin Community College. The Forum is a roundtable talk show that gives us a space to discuss openly pertinent topics concerning ACC and our community with various faculty, staff, students, and community members. Today, we'll be discussing Black Lives Matter, the movement, and the racial reckoning that's happening right now in our community, across the nation, and in some respects, the world. We've had various police shootings of unarmed black citizens, past and present, but most recently, Ms. Breonna Taylor and Mr. George Floyd, which have led to massive protests in Portland, D.C., New York City, L.A., and even here in Austin and worldwide. According to the Kaiser Foundation, nearly 26 million have self-reported attending a Black Lives Matter march, making it one of the largest movements in history. Marches have occurred across the U.S. in the wake of these killings. These marches, primarily peaceful, have been conducted in the spirit of equity, social justice, and a call for national and local political law enforcement leaders to deliver justice regarding these killings, hold police departments accountable for officers who unjustly commit crimes, and address other societal disparities for communities of color. Community members, leaders, and protesters are demanding reform and even to defund police to create new legitimate efforts for real change. And this is all occurring during a global pandemic and what some would say is the most pivotal election in our, in our lifetime. Joining me today are some amazing ACC colleagues who are truly committed to equity advocates, both for the institution and the community. Ms. Loretta Edelin, ACC's Director of Community Engagement. Ms. Terry Barksdale, who's a member of faculty and works in student development at ACC. Mr. Daryl Merriweather, who is an ACC Area of Studies Senior Advisor with Student Affairs. To my colleagues, um, and friends, and allies in this work, thank you so much for being here with me. I look forward to sharing this space and conversation with you. Let's get started. Black Lives Matter is a decentralized political and social movement advocating against incidents of police brutality and all racially motivated violence against black people. It was founded in 2013 after the acquittal of George Zimmerman, who killed Trayvon Martin. However, it wasn't until the killings of Michael Brown and Eric Gardner, both at the hands of police, that Black Lives Matter movement really started to gain momentum. So why does Black Lives Matter? Police are, more, are almost four times more likely to use force on black people versus white people, according to the Center for Policing Equity. Black men are nearly three times more likely than white men to be killed by police intervention, according to the American Journal of Health. Additionally, the disparities in every structural system in America, from the criminal justice system to housing, education, even the disparities in how COVID-19 is impacting the African American community, all sums of why this movement is so relevant, especially now. With that said, let's get some insight from our panel. My first question for the panel is, what, what, what does Black Lives Matter mean to you? And why should it matter to everyone? We'll start with Ms. Loretta. I'd like to, to go with the words of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, and that is that um, it is an affirmation of Black folks' humanity. And Black folks include men, women, queer, transgender, and others. Uh, it's a, a, an affirmation of our humanity, our contributions to the society, and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression. And basically making places uh, and spaces for those at the margins to be more closely uh, analyzed and and, and support it. Thank you, Ms. Loretta. Uh, Mr. Merriweather. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, great question, too. Um, Black Lives Matter, meaning for me, um, kind of entails what it is that, you know, it spells out. Um, it's just making sure that we embody the well being of Black citizens um, in this United States of America and across the world. Um, we are a strong fabric. Uh, a fabric that that is brought about in this community, um, state, this nation that we live in, and in order for us to thrive as a whole, Black lives have to matter as well. Um, and I also think that's why it's very important that it is um, embraced by all to kind of make sure that you know everybody's included in this process of being a part of this American platform that we live in. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Ms. Terry. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, I join voices with Mr. Merriweather and Ms. Adelin. Uh, Black Lives Matter is more than just a mantra. It's more than a movement. For me, as a middle-aged white woman who is only recently becoming more conscious of the enormous inequities 
um, between people who live my life of privilege simply because of the color of my skin and people who have less privilege simply because of the color of theirs. When I say Black Lives Matter, it is also a reminder to me as a white person not to simply fall back into my ease and my forgetting that there is an entire segment of our population in these United States for whom we profess that they have full rights and privileges. And then with our blinders on, we go about our merry way. I, being a part of Austin Community College has given me the gift of having my blinders pulled back in making me more aware of the unearned privilege in which I travel every day. There's so, so many disparities through every structural system in America, from the criminal justice system to housing, and education, as mentioned earlier, uh, even the disparities in how COVID-19 is impacting the African-American community. Um, is it a systematic problem? Which areas do you think have, have been the most problematic need to be altered and fixed first? Um, Miss, Miss, Miss Terry, what do you think? Thank you, Dr. Williams. What a great question. Um, one of the things that's in, that informs my thinking about this question is a document that was produced by uh, the Kellogg Foundation as they began approaching the truth, racial healing and transformation project overall. Um, and that foundational piece that Kellogg did helped frame my thinking around the fact that there are several fronts which takes a toll in our community. And because racism is so entrenched in our society, we can't choose which one we need to work on first. We need to work on all fronts at once. And in that pivotal piece, uh, from TRHT, developed by Kellogg, they talk about the economy. They talk about the criminal justice system. They talk about legislation and how legislation has been used for centuries to marginalize people. Um, and of course, education, the, the part of which we are all a part in and of, of which we care so deeply. Um, I think that the existence of your TRHT speaks volumes of the, the steps that we must take. This is the TRHT movement is a national movement of which Austin Community College is a And I think having that kind of movement grounding the momentum for this work is critically important. So if we use that framing piece from Kellogg that reminds us we have work to do in many areas, four pillar areas of our community, I think we will be well served. Um, there's much work to be done. Awesome, thank you, Ms. Terry. Uh, Mr. Mayweather? I will have to agree with, with Ms. Barksdale. Um, I, I don't think that there's just one area in which we need to just focus on first. I do think they all need to be addressed um, if we can at the same time. But in, in with, with addressing all those areas, I, I do think that if I had to use one term or one way in which I would like to take, it would be through education. Um, and if we could, you know, educate those involved, whether that's through formal settings or informal settings, I then think that we can empower and enrich everyone to kind of understand the platform that is being spoken about when it comes to Black Lives Matter. And then that can allow us to, to really kind of encompass all those four pillars as Ms. Barks still talk about, come to a nice um, agreement with reform and change. And then I think that that can kind of help, you know, break up some of the systemic problems that we do have and then kind of lead to a better outcome to kind of involve all as part of this process. Thank you, Mr. Mayweather. Ms. Ms. Eagle. I do have to agree with my colleagues in um, the, the uh, responses that they provided in terms of using uh, TRHT as a way to address this. I think with, it starts, though, with first acknowledging that these disparities exist, uh, and certainly the statistics show and it's in our community as well. This is not a national uh, thing. This is a local thing as well. Um, 
there is a nonprofit here in town called the Community Act Advancement Network that puts out what's called a dashboard, and it talks every year about what those uh, disparities look like. Uh, and when you look at the statistics in any and every category, almost, um, Blacks account typically for the highest rate of homeless, the highest rate of jailed, those negatively impacted by COVID-19, and neglect in physical and mental health, and the lowest in educational achievement. And so using that, uh, again, recognizing that the, dis that the disparities do exist is a big deal. But in addition to that, um, the whole issue of not blaming the victim for the disparities is key in, in my mind to how do we move forward and utilizing vehicles like TRHT to work collectively on that. But again, recognizing and as as um, as Cyril was saying, really using all of our efforts. I know that Terry said the same thing. Yeah. All of these have to be addressed, and so it's more about uh, examining the the very systems that generated these results, and how do we best impact positively impact change, and uh, ultimately serve all of our students, all of our citizens, all of our community in a more equitable fashion. Thank you, Ms. Evelyn. Mr. Merriwell? I'm glad um, Ms. Evelyn brought about the, the, the fact of community uh, because it, it is prevalent where we are today as we speak here in Austin, um, on the east side of Austin, great Austin area as well, too. But I, I kind of want to put another subset within that community and, and refer to you know us as being Black folk as well, too. Uh, I think that we can understand what those systemic issues are. If we can talk informally about those, I think that we can also bring about a great dialogue to the table when we come to kind of talk about these things as well, too. So I do feel like on the other side of the coin, we do not spend enough time understanding what the process looked like and how it has happened to us so that we can move forward in breaking down some of these barriers as well, too. So I hope that we can kind of use that as a way to kind of you know, talk about systemic change, um, reinforce it, and then make it more equitable, um, as Ms. Eden said, for, for us involved. And th thank you all. This this question really resonated with me because being um, a native of Flint, Michigan, and understanding and being able to see firsthand the impacts of what unemployment does to the community, which which then leads to a lagging ta tax base and crime and school systems that are st struggling. And now the water crisis, and it's not it's not just it's not one issue. It's they're so interconnected, and it it takes really a systematic change to to make things better for a, a city like Flint, Michigan, or a city like Chicago. Next question: uh, How is it happening now that Black Lives Matter is different now more than more than before? Um, as it it's been around for a while, but it feels like it's at we're at a tipping point, we're at a boiling point. So what's different now, Mr. Mayweather? Hey man, you know that, that's a good question right there, Dr. Williams. Man, I mean, you know, I can only see what or comprehend what I see on TV or what I may read in the book. I haven't had an opportunity to kind of actually step my toes into, you know, what was happening in the past. So, you know, I hope that, you know, more of what was shown in the past can be, you know, shown to us um in present day to kind of get a feel of what was done back then. But I, I don't think there's anything different. You know, I, I think everything that has happened in the past as repeating itself today. I think the same things that were spoken about and fought for back then are still being fought for today. Um, I, I believe that there were young folks that were pushed to move back then along with an older generation. The same thing is happening today. So, I mean, I don't see anything that's different um, besides just everything being more um, visible through social media and those kind of platforms that which kind of help promote and push and bring awareness to more of a larger group of folks um, to be a part of. But, but I, I think this has just been an extension of what's been going on, let's just say, for 400 years, you know, through rebellion of slavery, through the times through Reconstruction, you know, through segregation, you know, civil rights, all that. It, it's still, it has just generated more momentum, I guess you could say, in some degree, because of the platforms and now which we can use to kind of share the wealth and spread the word about what's going on. Um, when it comes to the injustices or inequalities that black folk have to deal with um, on an everyday basis. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Merriweather. Ms. Ms. Eaglin? I think Mr. Merriweather put his uh, his hand on the pulse in terms of um, what is exactly pushing this. And I think that it is the media and technology uh, in promoting the disparities that have that has been responsible in big part for how we view and how we get our information. For example, on May 25th, anyone with access to a television, technology of any sort, including smartphones, witnessed the killing of George Floyd. And that news was con instantly shared around the world. And so through technology, that message got out. We were shown how he was killed and who killed him. And that it was not in place 400 years ago. Uh, so there is more of an immediate, I think, access, as Mr. Merriweather pointed out, with, with social media, with, with the technology that we have, and certainly access to, to um, you know, all of that at our fingertips. And for whatever, uh, you know, however, whatever, that I think has been part and parcel of how um, the whole response and reaction to these injustices have uh, um, occurred and momentum has built as a result of that kind of exposure that's kind of in your face. It used to be that you, know, you, you only saw occurrences like that through National Enquirer or you know, the Globe or something like that, whereas or, you know, People Magazine or whatever, but, you know, now with this um, instant access to what's happening as it's happening, um, that allows people uh, more access to uh, what's actually taking place right now. Uh, and they don't really have to wait for results. I, I think for me, what the, the difference is, I, I believe late great Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, our late great uh, Mr. John Lewis, Congressman and Civil Rights Leader who recently passed. I think they understood the power of media. And I think that as I think about what happened on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, it was impactful because it happened, but it was also impactful because the media was present and they saw the brutality firsthand. Um, so when I think about Mr. George Floyd, I think that it's hard to kind of deny it. it almost eight of a man having a law enforcement officer on his neck and then himself dying. Um, but I, so I think the difference is our, our young people are um, bold and courageous in how they're using the media and how they're using it. Um, but I think they're just using the same spirit that's been passed on to us from, from the past leaders. Um, but I just really tip my hat to our young people because I think they're taking it a step further. And that's what we need. Well, thank you all for your great perspective. I'm going to take a short break. We'll be back to continue this conversation. Stay with us. Today marks the National Day of Racial Healing. It is important for all of our humanity to be in recognition of what each of us bring to the table, how our differences may not be as different as we think but they are all responsible for us being able to get along as human beings. They're both the ones that I did. For this one specifically, in the art world, whenever you have models, it's kind of hard to find women of color or even even males, male of color a lot. And so I had the same model that I repeated over and over again, but it was just the same skin tone. And I was like, I want to put some of myself in there. I want to put some other people in there too. The way you see it, I see me and you, beauty, that we can be excellent together, like oak trees holding on to our roots, making sure we don't fly when the storms come. We can be I always think it's beautiful for humans to come together in general, but to come together around something that's powerful and needed, talking about healing from a, from the traumas that racism has caused is really an important and beautiful conversation. And especially when you involve art and you know things that are loving and sweet that uh, isn't as hard to swallow, but needed and necessary to ingest.
There is more to me than what you see. My smile hides the pain I feel, the trauma I combat. My laughter is a force field that keeps people from asking questions. It's, it's a reflection of ACC's commitment to diversity and inclusion and being a part of bringing the community into the conversation. Um, so it's something that we're doing here at ACC, but it's also a community initiative. So we'll be engaging with community members, community leaders, and um, figuring out ways that we can continue this conversation to make uh, ACC and Austin a better place for all citizens and all students. Welcome back to the forum, where we are discussing the Black Lives Matter movement here with my guest today. There's a distinction that has become louder and perhaps more politicized in the 2020, in 2020 over the debate of Black Lives Matter, an idea and a movement versus All Lives Matter. Why do you feel this, this has become a response to the movement and how would you respond to someone that believes strongly that the movement should be All Lives Matter? Great question, Dr. Williams. I think uh, I would like to use the words of um, President Barack Obama who spoke on the debate between Black Lives Matter and all lives matter. Obama said, I think that the reason that the organizers used the phrase black lives matter was not because they were suggesting that no one else's lives matter. Rather, what they were suggesting was there is a specific problem that is happening in the African-American community that's not happening in other communities. He also says, that it is le a legitimate issue that we've got to address. When I wake up every morning, when I go to sleep at night, you know, I'm a black man, you know what I'm saying? So I have to wake up and embrace the fact that I'm a black man. And I have to first think about how I'm going to embedder my life as a black man. So my first thought is, how am I going to interact in an environment around me as being a black man? So I have to think first as a black man, as a black person, before I can encounter the world. And then once I'm able to do that, you know, see what it is that I need to kind of prepare myself when it comes to situational awareness, perception, comprehension, projection, then I think I can go out there and embrace all lives. But I cannot embrace all lives if I do not embrace who I am first as a black man um, in this society. So um, I think that's how I will address that. I hope that made some sense in, in a nutshell, but all lives do matter, but for me first, I have to make sure that my black life matter in the way that I carry myself on a day-to-day -day function in my livelihood. We are combating 400 years of socialization that demonstrated, no matter what words were coming out of our mouths, that demonstrated that black lives did not matter. So the reason we have to keep saying it over and over again is to dislodge 400 years of accepted misinformation. So, um, so I try to engage with people in my community in these difficult conversations because it helps me remember why it's important for me to keep saying Black Lives Matter and to remind people that I encounter in my culture, in my daily life, um, that they too can expand those blinders and enrich the own, uh, their own experience of their lives by integrating more fully with the richness of our entire community. I would say for me, um, I've been just made aware just moving throughout this world, this world that um, when I look like this, whether it's a, a customer service situation or a, an interaction with law enforcement, I'm usually I'm usually treated fairer. Um, I'm, I'm usually I, I usually have a better experience, but I don't always look like this. Um, on the weekends, I don't look like this. And I, and I think about some of the lessons my parents taught me before they handed me um, car keys at 17 year, years old. They gave me a whole conversation about what to do and what not to do to make sure I made it made it safely home. Um, even as an adult now, my mother taught me this trick that I still use if I'm in a parking lot where, where, when it's dark and it's dark and there's especially a, a white female or a white male there that I'm to j jingle my keys um, so they know that I'm there and they know that I'm not a threat. Um, so I, I, when I say Black Lives Matter, it's understanding that regardless of all my degrees and my my wonderful work I do here at ACC, I'm still in some in some some respects viewed as a threat when I don't look like this and I'm reminded of that. 
Um, so I think that I say it because I think we have some work to do. So moving on to the next question, uh, some opponents of the movement will say if black lives really matter in cities like Chicago or Detroit or Flint or New York, who have some challenging black on black crime statistics wouldn't exist. And what are your thoughts on this? And we'll start with Ms. Edelman. If you look at the data, you'll see that these communities, as you already pointed out in Flint, have been stripped of resources if they even had them in the first place. Um, it was intentional, especially in the case of Flint, uh, from the information that I've received, and that the issues need to be addressed by providing adequate resources, like easier access to quality education, food, health care, mental and physical, and good water. I mean, drinkable water. Um, these are just some basic kinds of needs. If you look at how these communities have been set up historically, you see certain patterns that exist across this country in terms of where these communities are, how they're set up, and the, the food deserts that exist, the lack of uh, health care that is consistently not there, the lack of quality education. I mean, all of these characteristics are not singular in any of these particular communities. And again, that's true of Austin and the surrounding area. Thank you, Ms. Eason. Um, I think about Flint, Michigan. And, and for me, there's no doubt in my mind that if a water crisis occurred in Austin, Austin, Texas, that we as a community or we as a country would figure it out. Um, but I, I feel like some communities are, aren't given that same um, support and, and love and care. Uh, so I think there's work to do, and I think that there, there has to be some responsibility from the black community, but I think that resources are a real thing, and we can't can't fix it without resources. Uh, along these same uh, lines, substantive change has to be a goal. Uh, Austin City Council, in response to outcries to change uh, due to the police shooting of Mr. Mike Ramos, recently announced a $150 million budget cut to the police department. The funds cut will be reallocated to areas like violence prevention, food access, and abortion access programs. What are your thoughts on the idea of defunding the police and will this help the problems at hand? We'll start with Ms. Loretta. There should be um, a change in how police officers, as a for instance, are trained, um, utilizing the equity office that exists within the city uh, mm -hmm. to have that racial lens, I think is the way that we be begin to interrupt what may have been practice in the past, but if there is a focus and if there's a real buy-in and um, commitment to making a change for how the police certainly serve our community, it's, it's, it's certainly a needed asset, I think, uh, in the community, but I think it's also one that has to be responsible. When you look at the deaths that have occurred here in Austin and Michael Ramos was right after George Floyd or right around the time of George Floyd, right here in Austin. And there are several people that were uh, critically injured as protesters, yeah. just protesters who got hit and, and injured, brain damage and all kind of stuff because of beanbag um, um, bullets that were, that were rained upon them. And so if there is an understanding, if there is a training opportunity uh, and collaboration for our officers, as well as those other entities, mental health, the same things that I talked about, the homelessness, all of those things, the drug addiction, all of those folks that are inter interacting with those that they're actually working with, if they've got the training that includes and incorporates that racial lens that needs to be there in terms of how do you address people? How do you really kind of engage people in a way that de-escalates the situation? But just to kind of backpack off what Ms. Eden said, I, I think the resources that they're talking about examining and providing, um, the resources that will be readily accessible to those who need it. You know, that's what I'm hoping to kind of be the biggest change that can kind of help the community. Because, I mean, what's, what is it to kind of provide a homeless outreach project, but then, you know, it may take me three buses to get to that, that opportunity to kind of be a part of that process, you know, or, you know, any food securities, you know what I'm saying, trying to address the issue with food deserts, you know, what if I had to go on the other side of town to get to that and I don't have the access to get it? So, 
we can make sure that whatever we do to defund, take away those resources, that, that monetary um, component to that and put it in those communities right there where people can get to them at any given time, then I think that will be the greatest benefit that can happen for our community when it comes to providing that opportunity for folks. I also want to point out that if we look historically at how policing came into being in the United States, but we have to recognize that the roots of our police system were to recapture a slave, slave yeah. and return them to their owners. If that is the root of this service to the community, then I completely endorse a complete overhaul of that system. I'm not sure that a system that was built to recapture and return enslaved humans is the system that can support our 21st century society. But if it can, it must be completely dismantled, re-examined piece by piece, and put back together based on our 21st century definition of humanity. Yeah, I think what's more so for me is a reallocation of some resources to benefit some other community of social services. So like, for example, many of the killings have happened because um, law enforcement officials were called for um, community members who were having mental health breaks and they didn't know how to respond. And the response was to use force. Uh, and, but that, that wasn't necessarily what was needed for that situation. So I just think more, more, more resources for other social services that can serve some of these needs would, would help our community and would help the relationships between our communities and law enforcement because they're not always equipped to handle some of those situations that they're caught upon. We're going to take a break and up next we will discuss Black Lives Matter at Austin Community College. Welcome back to the forum where we where we are discussing Black Lives Matter and the movement happening in our country today. I want to pivot our discussion to focus a bit more about Black Lives Matter at ACC and how and why they matter here. Let's start with playing a short clip from some of our current and former students about their experiences, experiences and when it comes to diversity and inclusion at the college. Equity to me means giving everyone uh, resources that fit their needs and giving them the best opportunities possible, meeting them where they are. Never being felt like you're not included. You know, never being an outsider when there's a group of people. You want everyone to be represented. You don't want just this still kind of one tone operation. You know, you want to see those different ideas. You want to see those different backgrounds. My experience at ACC was like phenomenal. You know, it's like I'm just going to school to meet like another family. You come to a place like ACC and the doors and arms are both open wide. I felt wanted um, simply by the organization. Some of the stuff that they offer, like ACC offers that's really helped out is um, the constant support. They've been vital in uh, allowing me to become the student that I am. They've been vital in, in uh, getting me acclimated into the coursework that comes with it. It's a great place to walk into and be welcomed and people listen to you and people want to hear you. I will tell a new student, welcome, you have taken a good step in the right direction. So, I mean, just step into it. If you don't know what you're doing yet, I mean, someone's going to be there to help you figure it out if you don't already know. And if you do know, then they're just going to guide you along until you get to where you need to be. Just you taking this chance today is is pushing you forward and pushing your family forward. There's inclusion groups everywhere. So any group that you want to join, it's going to be diverse. Any group that you want to start, it's going to be diverse. So there's always going to be a seat at the table for any student. Get ready for the best ride of your life. This is going to be 
exciting, it's gonna be different, and it's gonna be worth it for sure. <laughs> Man, I, I think the students are what pushes us as an institution, as, as leaders, and as leaders to get better. Um, so I appreciate their very insightful perspectives uh, uh, from both our students and our recent graduates. I know, I know many of them and are excited about the work they're doing here to make us better and the work they'll do in the community and in, in the organizations they join as they, they leave ACC. Um, what is ACC doing to ensure Black Lives Matter by closing equity gaps and helping Black and all students of color feel welcome, celebrated, and supported? Um, so kind of along the lines of what we just saw in the videos, but what are we doing specifically to, to address the Black Lives Matter discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayweather? Dr. Williams, I, I think um, the video kind of shows a starting point, you know, giving, you know, Black students the opportunity to be visible. Um, you know, I think that is a key component into anything that you want to kind of help bridge or close any gaps that may be between any marginalized groups or any students that if we're talking in this instance that may be a part of a community college or a college setting. Um, so just being able to be vocal, um, not be um, hindered or any sense to kind of stay um, closed when it comes to their caption and what they want to speak about, I think is a great way for ACC to start at that. And I think it's also important that ACC start looking at ways to hire more folks on the academic side, uh, on the instructional side, and then within student affairs that look like um, our students that represent our black student population. I think I've seen not too long ago that some data points show that um, we have a very low um, population of African-American black um, instructors, um, also administrators, also folks that work on the student affairs side too. So I think once our students can, the of color can see more of that representation, I think they'll be able to you know, utilize this place as a place of welcome, not only as a place of growth, but to be welcome so that they can grow. And then that way we can kind of close those gaps um, in which we see. And then also make sure we provide resources in the community that can also help our students as well too. So reach out to those, you know, black businesses, um, organizations, um, other institutions to kind of help us also close those gaps and um, bridging those partnerships as well. I'm always excited to hear our students they represent our biggest champions. They also represent our greatest opportunity to market uh, what we do and um, our greatest um, supporters, really. And uh, it was a great privilege for me not too long ago to actually encounter a young man who considered himself to be the first ACC student, Emmett Thompson, back in 1973 when we opened. And he is still excited about that experience. And so I think that that whole issue of welcoming students and making them feel like this is where you belong. Uh, one of the gentlemen said on the on the um, interview, that no one feels left out. Uh, you don't feel like you, you, you really don't belong here. So I, I, I think that that is uh, at least the energy that I see in, in those that uh, were interviewed and hope that that's the kind of atmosphere. I know that the data bears out that our students typically feel welcomed, but I think the ultimate goal is not only welcomed when they first come in, but also welcomed in their classroom experience and in other encounters that they have throughout their uh, matriculation here at ACC. And so it's exciting always to hear that input from our students and to hear um, their heartfelt um, reaction to what their experience has been like. You know, I think that one of the things that ACC has taken to heart is that this work cannot be siloed. This can be Dr. Williams with a great message trying to reach you know, 41,000 students and 3,000 staff. This has to be the entire institution. And I am proud that ACC got behind establishing the TRHT that has established a chief diversity officer on the academic side of the house. We have instituted um, 
is in training for faculty hiring to do the very important work of shifting the demographics of our faculty make be more reflective of our body. But in addition to that, the Teaching and Learning Excellence Division, TLED, has been working for several years to integrate equity into every piece of the system for faculty. We're going to take another break and we'll be right back. I mean, I don't even know where to start. It really means ACC is for everyone because it really is. At any stage of life you're in, ACC will meet you right there. To me, what immediately comes to mind is the diversity of classes here and just being able to explore whatever you want to. It offers classes in just about everything. I really love that you're free to take the classes that are in your degree, but you can also decide, you know what, I've always died to learn some Japanese, I'm gonna sign up for Japanese, and you can do it. In my ACC classes, there is such a, a diverse array of people from different backgrounds. I met people from Germany, from Poland, from Ukraine, Mexico. Ex-military veterans. The thing that I really love too is the LGBTQ community on campus. It, it welcomes you in and takes you as you are. And I think everybody benefits when we are in studying next to people who are different. I didn't realize how much support I was going to get at ACC. They kind of try and think about, I guess, every reason why a student may feel hesitant to go, and they say, okay, well, how can we support them in that way? They provide a, a, a whole lot of resources for you to be able to get done what you need to get done. So no matter what you do, no matter what time you work. ACC is like, well, you know, here it is. You know, here's your resource. ACC really is about just learning and then bettering oneself. Wife, mother of four, working. I can say now that if, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I mean, there's no excuse. <laughs> Welcome back to the forum where we're talking about Black Lives Matter as a movement, but also as a focus here at Austin Community College. So I wanted to end on a hopeful and positive note and hopefully give our audience some food for thought and basic tips we can all do to help bring equity and justice to everyone in the world because it's all of our work, right? Um, so starting with ACC, what can staff and faculty and students do to make ACC um, better in these efforts for positive change? Um, what are your thoughts, Ms. Terry? Thank you, Kyrie. Um, you know, especially right now during these interesting times in COVID, um, I think that we all need to be thinking creatively of what we can do rather than, you know, oh, well, at campus, I would be doing this. Um, so some of the things that I'm trying to integrate into my practice, right, and, and I'm hoping that somebody who's watching this who might look like me may these tips useful. Um, I have started having one book that I'm reading about race and racism bedside at all time. Um, Stamped from the beginning has been a powerful one for me. Another one that was really an eye opener is So You Want to Talk About Race. Um, both of those I encourage folks who look like me to uh, take a look at. Um, another thing that I think is so important is that as we engage day to day, and again, I'm, I'm reaching out to folks who have who share my skin color. As we engage day to day, if we can be mindful of the way we carry ourselves with the privilege, our unearned privilege that we walk into a room with, and consider that when we're engaging in conversation with others. In particular, if we find ourselves at um, a meeting, a, a, a table where there are people of power, where decisions are being made, we can use our privilege to say, I wonder if we might be better served to have this additional voice represented at the table as we make this decision, right? So being conscious enough to interrupt these things that we take for granted as well as just part of the system. We need to be conscious enough to interrupt in those moments when if we are 
conscious, we can make more equitable decisions by considering the viewpoints of people who so often are not at the table at those moments when decisions are being made. So that would be a couple of things. Read to, you know, peel those blinders back and be courageous in using uh, your your unearned privilege and use your voice in those moments when you see power decisions made without everyone's voice being in it. I agree with uh, Ms. Barksdale on just the focus on do that doing that introspection, um, look, seeking opportunities for RH racial healing circles, and hopefully working in concert with the Truth Racial Healing Transformation Center in uh, recognizing those opportunities, but also seeking other opportunities like the the uh, upcoming National Indigenous Celebration that is supposed to be happening on October 12th. And we have a speaker coming in uh, at, I believe, the Riverside campus. But just seeking out opportunities to uh, not only educate ourselves, but to recognize what's kind of going on internally and how are we uh, reacting to various things that are going on, but finding a way to to utilize that positive energy in a way that's going to hopefully um, help others and um, address some of those inequities. One of which I'm not sure when this is going to be aired, but certainly if you've not um, filled out the census, that's something that's critical for all of our futures. Um, and that is going to be either ending like the end of next month or this month. But again, just taking advantage of that opportunity if you haven't already done that. And certainly registering to vote if you have not already done that. That deadline is happening uh, on October 5th. And then actually going and voting. Um, my understanding is that ACC's campuses are not going to be voting uh, locations this time as far as providing polls, but there are other places that you can access through your county um, to figure out where they are. But all of these opportunities and all of these uh, practices really show, uh, articulate how important we feel about our own future and how we treat others. Uh, you doing the research, you know, looking through the League of Women Voters guide that they put out that gives um, nonpartisan uh, responses to uh, our displays of who those candidates are, but making sure that those that are put in powers of the ability to make decisions for large numbers of us are uh, you, you, you're well versed on what they stand for and attending those debates and attending those forums that allow you to ask questions of them to make sure that they're doing what they need to do, but also holding them, them accountable. So we each have a role in, um, in this effort and certainly just treating one another with that humanity and that respect that we certainly hope for in return. Um, and, and again, you, using uh, different organizations, different different uh, entities, whether it's your church or your organization that you may already belong to or groups that you already work within to generate, you know, discussion like um, Sparksdale was saying, whether it's a book club or, you know, just some other kind of entity. I think that it's important for us to keep this conversation going. We'll be having some um, real talk. Uh, conversations that we're going to be starting up next month and hopefully we'll get that information out to everybody, but to just begin the conversation on voting on on some of those issues that impact us greatly. But I, I, I deeply appreciate the opportunity for us to have a discussion like this and for us as a community to again be introspective on how we approach how we treat each other. Man, I've been sitting here <laughs> this whole time just amazed on how I'm a part of this panel discussion with, you know, with so much grace, knowledge, 
and wisdom. Um, Ms. Elin, Ms. Barksdale, I mean, it, it's been an honor to be on this panel with you all. I, I'm still trying to understand how I got this call. So I thank you, Dr. Williams, for allowing me to be a part of this. Um, no yeah, 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 but one thing I'm going to do, and then I also call others to do, is just to listen, learn, and love. You know, we can kind of do that in the sense of introspection. I think that can really kind of help us, you know, put a, a, a tight rope uh, or, or, or gather around what we need to do to close all these gaps, disparities, uh, when it comes to, you know, any equities or injustices that we are dealing with, whether it's in the academic setting or whether it's outside of that, to, to, to kind of really bridge those gaps. And uh, lastly, uh, any, any thoughts around any organizations or resources in the community that our students or staff or faculty can be a part of to can, kind of increase their learning and continue their learning? I was just going to say there are so many organizations here in Austin and the surrounding community that have a focus on social justice, that have a focus on how to better our community. There are too many to name. And so I would just encourage folks, if you already have a passion for a particular um, group or affinity, whether that's mentoring or tutoring or more social activism, or policy support or you know activism in that area i would just google those in terms of where you are and what's going on in your particular community dr williams i'd like to mention that um leadership austin on their website regularly posts opportunity for registering for a two-day workshop called beyond diversity a very powerful opportunity for those in Austin. Um, and in addition, I mentioned before, but want to mention again, the Teaching and Learning Academy, uh, something faculty at ACC can sign up for. There are several different iterations of how that's offered where you can take it during the fall and spring semester or take a half of it each summer for two consecutive summers. Um, and those are some, oh, and there's another series offered by Jeff Johanigman and Chelsea Biggerstaff um, called Discovering Your Blind Spots. Yeah. And it specifically addresses equitable pedagogy in the classroom. Those are all that I would strongly encourage anyone um, who's affiliated with Austin Community College on the side to investigate. That's all we have time for today. We can keep going on forever on this topic, but I appreciate our esteemed guests and panelists joining me today for this very important conversation, as well as our student perspectives. To our viewers, thank you so much for watching the forum today. We hope you've learned a thing or two as well. Be sure to check out more about Austin ACC's Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Center and stay up to date on our events and future discussions on our website, austincc.edu slash TRHTC. I'm Dr. Williams, we'll see you next time. <laughs>